Okay. okay. Uh, good evening and welcome to this uh, webinar tonight, uh, Wednesday, the 18th of November. Our presenter is uh, certainly well qualified to speak on a subject that uh, she will go into in just a few moments, the title of which is Resilience, Taking Charge of Your Life During a Pandemic. Now, before I introduce our presenter, Dr. Eileen burns uh, just some, some uh, uh, parenthetical thoughts here, bullet items that I picked off of uh, an online report this afternoon uh, for us to think about. The FDA authorized today the first at-home coronavirus test. New York City will shutter all public schools again as virus cases increase. A mini outbreak on Capitol Hill is threatening to disrupt the business of Congress. New Orleans has announced that there will be no parades during the February 2021 Mardi Gras celebrations. And uh, today it was this evening it was reported on the network news that the uh, national count of people who have passed away as a result of the pandemic has now exceeded 250,000. Our speaker this evening, Dr. Eileen burns is a life and leadership coach, educator and speaker based in North Suburban Chicago. She writes about navigating personal and professional life with resilience, meaning, mindfulness, and well-being. Upon uh, Earning her bachelor's degree in education and natural science, science, Eileen began her career working in the pharmaceutical and medical supply field as a sales rep. Later with a master's in science and human resource development, she led an innovative multi-community prevention program bringing public and private organizations together to proactively reduce youth substance abuse in seven suburban communities. In 1999, Eileen returned to graduate school earning master's and a PhD degree, both degrees in psychology. Across her career, Eileen has provided group education and training in varied settings and on a wide range of topics. Since 2003, she has led seminars for an employee assistance and wellness program, serving companies across the United States. Following her love of teaching, Eileen was a college instructor bachelor's and master's for nine years. For 11 years, she taught science and middle school students at a public school and was a multidisciplinary team leader for teaching staff. Uh, it's my pleasure to present to you this evening, again, the topic, strengthening your resili resilience during this unprecedented time, recharging your toolbox with greater well-being, calm, and empowerment, Dr. Eileen burns there. Thank you, Nor Norwin. Thanks so much. It's good to be with everybody this evening. Everybody can hear me okay? Good? Okay. Um, this, these are tough times, as Norwin just, you know, uh, spoke so uh, clearly about. This is, we, you know, we all know we're facing as individuals and as a country and as a world, a, a lot of challenges, a lot of hardships. And, and for many of us, this is not the first time in our lives that we've experienced tough times. All of us are here, and and because of that, you know, I, I would estimate that 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 most of us or all of us have struggled at various points in our lives. What comes with uh, a pandemic and adversity and difficult times in our lives? Resilience. And so tonight we're going to talk about how do we recharge our resilience. And resilience is basically. Uh, our ability to get through, to overcome, and even to thrive during difficult times. A time of extraordinary challenge and, strength and stress is also really an extraordinary opportunity to build our resilience. Yes, that's a bit of a reframe, but it's, but it's really uh, true. Um, many of us are children or grandchildren of the greatest generation what we called the greatest generation. How did they become the greatest generation? They, you know, they lived through many of them. The, uh, the World War I, the pandemic of 1918 that we are all so familiar with hearing about now, the Great Depression, World War II, the Cuban Missile, the Cuban Missile Crisis. They got through those times. They were resilient in order to be able to do that. And, and again, we call them the greatest generation. And, and we 
are also dealing with our stresses in our time. So um, resilience, I mean, I want to mention to you that resilience is, is not unusual. Resilience is actually quite ordinary. You know, we all have been resilient at different points in our times, in our lives. And it's not solid or fixed. Resilience is always in motion. We can always gain more skills for our toolbox of resilience. And that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna talk about tonight because resilience is, a, is really a process. And resilience is not about really about bouncing back as people often say, but it's really about going forward. So um, these are, whoop, hold on. These are our learning objectives for this, this evening. Again, we'll talk about resilience and our, our, our capacities to respond to and overcome adversities and, and challenges. I'm gonna talk about it a lot of, from the perspective of positive psychology, which is really an evidence-informed science about flourishing um, and a lot of the factors that contribute to resilience, but not only resilience, but improving our well-being and happiness. And we'll use an acronym called PERMA and we'll talk about that uh, in that in that sense. I hope that you'll walk away with one or more strategies that you can uh, apply in your everyday life, and, and, and perhaps several. So. Um, Often when I speak in person, I actually bring little nuggets like these and share them with people who want to take them away uh, with, the, with the hope that, again, that you'll be able to walk away with at least, you know, one meaningful idea or nugget in, uh, that, that you'll be able to carry into, you know, your professional or personal life. Um, I, I don't know that there's anything more I need to say about me, Norman, thank you for, for, for sharing about me. Uh, if you, uh, if as we're talking though today, you find that I can be of, of service in any way uh, in terms uh, as a coach, I'm a, a coach uh, certified by the International Coaching Federation. I also write a, a pretty nice newsletter uh, that I send out monthly. If you'd like to get in touch with me at any, for any, whatever reason, my website, ibzcoaching.com. And here, here's my email address as well. And I'd be happy to follow up. I also, if anyone just even responses or uh, reactions to, to this evening's talk. Okay. And uh, this evening, if at any point you have questions, uh, Norwin's gonna be keeping track of those and we will, we'll, we will leave some time for uh, questions at the end this evening. Right, Norwin? Correct, yes. Yeah. So, um, this is a Jewish organization. I thought I'd mention just a bit about about teshuva, right? You know, in the Jewish calendar, we are at the beginning of uh, our Torah reading cycle, the, the Book of Genesis, which which uh, can remind us every that every year is an opportunity to return. Every year is an opportunity to begin again, and really, you know. Uh, we are, as Jews, we're always invited to begin again, to learn from our own lives and learn uh, from each other. You know, we make mistakes, we, we learn and we grow, just like we read about the challenges of, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Um, we are all human beings, we're all learning. And, and this idea of, of returning is a very Jewish idea and really invites us to know that change is possible. And that resilience is possible, really, at, at most points in our lives. Uh, and that resilience is really a, a foundation that enables us to show up in the world in a positive way. So again, tonight we'll talk about, you know, some strategies, you know, around this. So throughout our lives, really, at any stage, resilience is key. Is key. My mother is 93. She struggles quite a bit. But my mother is, is resilient and, and some days she does better and, and some days she struggles and then the next day she just comes roaring back again. Um, so this ability to, to adapt to life's challenges um, is one that we really can uh, uh, carry with us and enable within ourselves at many points in our lives. We may not have control over what's happening externally, but we do typically have control over our attitudes and our responses. Right? And these skills can be learned and practiced. Okay, F you know, and figuring out what can I change, what can't I change, and what can I do to live a life that's as full and active as possible at any given point. And and right now, for you know, that's 
uh, being able to do that within the constraints of this pandemic. Uh, so I'd like to just throw out a quick question, which is when you think about resilience, what com what comes to mind? And if anyone, you know, a word or a few words, uh, you want to type it into the chat box, um, then uh, please do so to, sh to share those. What do you think of when you think about resilience? And while we're, you know, while that's going on, if anyone does want to shoot, write anything in there, let's talk a bit about resilience and why it's important. So again, this ability to uh, be resilient, to respond to life's challenges, it doesn't make the challenges go away, but this resilient mindset can help us learn from a situation. Uh, again, e even after the September 11th terrorist attacks, the people de commonly demonstrated resilience, not just in New York, but across the country. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this. The Chinese word for crisis is actually two characters that signify danger and also opportunity. And so we can see these, it's possible to see the adversities in our lives as opportunities. So I mentioned positive psychology earlier. Okay, I've devoted a lot of uh, study to this emerging field of positive psychology that really uh, began emerging at about the beginning of this century. Okay, and positive psychology systematically studies the factors that contribute to our living our lives with greater well being. A lot of psychology focuses on what's wrong with people, and positive psychology looks at what's right with people. In other words, what behaviors, what practices, what environments can help people flourish? And it really helps to complement the fix what's wrong approach. So one of the acronyms uh, that can be helpful is an acronym that's called PERMA. And, and you see that here, you know, in front of you. And these five pillars, actually six pillars, because I'm going to add an H at the end here, are the factors that contribute to positive well-being. Okay. And and um, and so we can look here that uh, P for positive emotions, and we'll talk about each of these. Uh, in more detail in just a bit. But experiencing positive emotions like gratitude, optimism, joy, serenity, hope, uh, interest, love can help us, you know, it feels, it feels good to experience uh, good feelings, pleasurable feelings, and actually help to contribute to, to our well-being, okay? Uh, it's, this is not about, n about ignoring the negative emotions, but more about finding and recognizing the positive emotions also. Again, we'll talk about this a little more on the next slide. The E for engagement. And this is the ability to become deeply engaged or passionate about something. It is sometimes referred to as flow. And the sense of being so immersed in an activity that time seems to, seems to stop. Another component for well-being is relationships. And this probably does not come as a surprise to, to uh, any of you who are, uh, probably most of whom are involved in uh, the men's clubs, right? And, and, and perhaps at your synagogues, but social connections, whether with family, peers, friends, community at work are really good for us and are especially good for us during challenging times. And, and studies are really clear that social connections and relationships really matter. And that reaching out to other people, it's not just okay, but it's really a very helpful strategy to bolster us uh, both during positive times and challenging times. The M is for uh, meaning and experiencing purpose and meaning in our lives, using our, our strengths uh, in the service of something that's larger than we are, you know, in some way having a greater purpose of, in life. And the A is for accomplishment or achievement, 
realistic goals, whether small goals or large goals, and then working to achieve them. And uh, we're going to add an H here for health, so PERMA H. So uh, movement, exercise, you know, uh, what, what, we, what we do in order to feel uh, alive, the aliveness, you know, in our mind, body, and spirit. So the resilience toolbox. Um, there we go. Um, leveraging our strengths. We're not going to talk much about strengths tonight, but if any of you are interested in learning more about your strengths, there's a great a tool called the VIA, V-I-A, which is a free uh, inventory that you can take it's been re, it's been taken by over 7 million people across the country that will help you identify your top 24 strengths okay and and where they fall for you it's a great it's a great tool it's another seminar but it's a it's really uh when we know what our strengths are we can leverage them and uh use them uh in all the aspects of our lives Improving tolerance for adversity and change. And we'll talk more about that tonight. And, and then having a growth mindset, the idea that, and the knowing that I can continue to learn, I can continue to grow and change. And then these other five that we talked about just a bit before, positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, and achievement. So let's turn uh, first here to building positive emotions. Uh, over the longer term, building positive emotions is really important for building well-being uh, in our abilities. So some examples of positive emotions. I'm going to throw out a few here. And if anyone wants to share, again, in the chat box, uh, uh, other positive emotions that come to mind for you, please, please do. So we've got some up here. Uh, gratitude, joy, happiness, humor, hope optimism, love, other positive emotions that people experience or that you particularly like. Again, if anyone wants to share them in the chat box. The more we can experience positive emotions, we're able to return more quickly to a positive state of well-being. It helps us feel more resilient. And um, and it just feel good, right? So conversely, the so-called negative emotions, you know, frustration, anger, uh, et cetera, can limit our openness to new ideas and connections. And again, I'm not here saying don't experience negative emotions. We all experience these so-called negative emotions as well. Um, but, but trying to create opportunities to experience positive emotions is really important. And really we benefit from, a bit, from positive and negative emotions. And when we experience negative emotions, it can really serve as a, a, a counterpoint, uh, a counter viewpoint from which to, to notice our positive emotions. Maybe positive emotions wouldn't feel so good if sometimes we didn't feel kind of bad, right? If we didn't feel the negative emotions, right? And, Positive emotions can come from the simplest moments, from the simplest kinds of moments. It doesn't have to be big stuff. It can be little stuff. Uh, noticing, uh, you know, we, we had the new moon, Rosh Chodesh yesterday, right? Um, the touch of someone's hand. Well, that, and then we're not, a lot of us aren't so able to experience that right now. A conversation with a friend. Maybe bringing some food to the food pantry. Again, I'm going to just throw out if anyone would like to share. And I don't know if people uh, actually. My chat only goes to you, Norwin. I'm not sure if other people yes, can. Yes, we do have uh, some things that are are evident here. Uh, uh, getting back to, uh, if we can backtrack just a little bit in sure. terms of uh, in terms of the uh, the uh, point you mentioned earlier about uh, getting through the tough times. Uh, one participant uh, uh, suggested Holocaust survivors getting through the difficulties mm. uh, that uh, uh, certainly continued as as uh, as they made a new life for themselves elsewhere. Uh, another uh, gentleman uh, staying positive in times of difficulty. You have 
and staying in time, staying positive in times of difficulty, uh, which you uh, have already expressed, uh, Eileen. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see. Um, being you know, in, in, in terms of the, the positive experiences, uh, one of our uh, participants tonight, Barry Bellick, uh, said being with our new grandson uh, is a positive yeah. experience. Yeah. Thanks, Norman, and okay. thank you to those who shared. Is that is that everything you've got there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, one one also said uh, uh, good health, experiencing good health. Yeah. A sense of wonder. Yeah, sense of wonder, that sense of awe, right? Uh, I think good health is one um, um, I know I appreciate a lot more than I probably ever have before. Um, so let's, let's move on then. If anyone else has anything they want to add about ways that you, uh, uh, you know, that bring you positive emotions, please go ahead and, and continue that to, to write those in the chat box. And um, we'll go forward. What I'd like okay. to do is share with you um, a tool for your gratitude for your resilience toolkit around gratitude. Gratitude is one of the uh, practices that's that has been very very highly correlated with well-being and resilience. And of course, uh, you know, giving thanks is a found foundation you know, of Judaism and of Jewish practices. Uh, you know, the traditional practice of, you know, as we give thanks for bread, for wine, for food, uh, the, you know, our liturgy, you know, in the morning, the, when we speak the words of Modani, thank you for waking me up this morning. And, and so um, gratitude has been, has consistently showed uh, a correlation with enhanced feelings of personal well-being. So I'd like to share with you a few ideas for, you know, gratitude applications. One of them is a, is a gratitude journal. And it, well, it doesn't have to be a journal, but just simply jot, jotting down, setting aside a little bit of time every day to record moments of gratitude. There's not a right way to do it, and it does not have to be big stuff. It's really just developing a, a daily habit of noticing gratitude-inspiring events and just focusing on what, what's going on. Yeah, uh, so and so acknowledged me today. You know, I felt I felt good when I saw my grandchild. It was it was nice to see the sun out today. Right? Um, it was great to have a men's club meeting tonight and and see my friends on Zoom. You know, um, and and a lot of times it's recommended just give it a try for a week, every day for a week. You know, think about or or, or better yet, write down three things that one is grateful for. Try it for a week, see how you feel. Right? Um, it's, it's, it's a good practice. Uh, prayers of gratitude. Uh, Robert Ammons, a researcher on gratitude, said 75% of people who, who he researched would like to spend more time in prayer. Most of the prayers that people use are very casual. They're not, they're just ca you know, conversational. You know? Uh, you know, I'm thankful for this. I'm, I'm grateful for this. Visual reminders can can remind us to be grat to be grateful. You know, maybe posting a phrase that of thankfulness or something, or I appreciate such and such. You know, on the mirror or on the computer screen, or as a reminder on the phone. Okay, using just simple gratitude language. Yeah. So in 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 one's vocabulary, adding phrases like I feel fortunate that, right, or I feel blessed about this or I'm thankful that can make a difference. Uh, I, I'm gonna guess that there's a lot of people here that will generate with this one, which is doing something helpful for someone else and how good, how, how good that feels. And even the smallest gestures can make a difference. You know, opening a door for someone, um, donating food at the food pantry or donating an hour or a few hours of your time in some way, letting someone in front of you, you know, in line Two people on Zoom want to speak at the same time, letting the other person speak first, right? <laughs> Saying thank you. Uh, I, had a, I was, did another uh, group this morning and people were talking about that when they're going for their walks, uh, they, they are waving to people even with the masks on, right? Or saying hello to people and, and how good that feels during this time. 
Um, another a gratitude related, but even bigger practice is, are, you know, is, is pausing during the day. So do you pause during the day, maybe for a moment of, I'm going to use the word mindfulness, but even just pausing for a moment to just take a breath and notice it. Maybe being thankful for that breath. Um, uh, being grateful for that breath. So, so, so breathing, right? And noticing our breath. Right? Again, another whole, a lot of talk practices we can talk about related to that. Uh, Right in front of you here, I, I have the word gratitude visit or the two words gratitude visit. So one of the practices that is uh, quite well known and has been studied quite a bit that was developed by Dr. Dr. Martin Seligman, who was the pioneer of the field of positive psychology, it's called the gratitude visit. Now, during the pandemic, we might not be sitting face to face like this and forgive me for that picture. We might conduct a gratitude visit again by phone or on Zoom or, or at, a, at a greater distance. But let me tell you what it is. Think about someone who in some important way has changed your life, whether recently or whether, you know, at an earlier point in your life, maybe a teacher, a family member, a friend, a mentor, a colleague, a boss, mm -hmm. right? And someone who was especially kind or did something good for you. And you write a letter to that person directly to that person, being really specific about how that person has impacted you and, and thanking that person. Doesn't have to be a big long letter, can be short. And then, and then calling that person or emailing that person and asking if you can visit with that person. Again, perhaps a remote visit right now, okay? And then if possible, sharing the letter with that person and then reading that letter to that person. If that person isn't with us anymore, Maybe you can read it or share it with someone else. Right? Um, it's, a, it's a really great activity and it, it really helps to build well-being. If you want to know more about it, if you actually just Google gratitude visit, you can learn some more about it. Again, if anyone has comments or questions as we're uh, you know, going on, please you know, just uh, insert those in, for Norwin there, okay? And again, we'll leave time later. Um, so let's go on to engagement. I'm just going to speak about this briefly. But uh, engagement is this ability to become deeply engaged or passionate about something. And when we can do this, when we can feel really involved, it's, re again, really good for us. So anything that we do where we become, if we're fortunate enough, that we become maybe so immersed that we lose track of time maybe. You know, it gets us to focus on one thing at a time. It usually involves some challenge but a challenge that fits our capacities. It, if it's too hard, it's usually not going to create this kind of a flow, okay? Um, but it, uh, this is, a, a, again, a really good strategy. Uh, if anyone has any ideas of anything that brings you engagement, it's a, I know for me, it's, um, it's singing and I've been playing around on my guitar, which I hadn't done for a long time. I have been losing track of time. My husband has to make dinner. Right. Um, if, again, if anyone else has a, a, a comment like that uh, around what brings you flow or engagement, it would be, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, the next one is the uh, X is the R, which is relationships, and relationships are absolutely critical for resilience and actually for our survival. There's robust. Scientific, scientific evidence that really validates the benefits of relationships. And it doesn't just have to be those really close, like kind of best friends or spousal relationships. You know, even bro brief moments of connection can really make a positive difference, right? Uh, and lack of social connection can really uh, increase our, our, our health risks in ways that are similar to, you know, smoking or lack of physical activity. If we, if we sort of fast forward to the work of uh, one researcher, or psychologist Barbara Fredrickson, who is a leading researcher on emotions and relationships, she says, love uh, blossoms virtually any time two or more people, even strangers, connect over a shared positive emotion, whether a mild one or a strong one. So even brief moments 
uh, of connection can, can actually even impact our body's chemistry. Some of you might be familiar with the, the hormone oxytocin. You know, it actually can be can be measured there. So social interactions, right, can really make a big difference. And that's, of course, a little bit more difficult right now during this period of time. And, you know, thankfully, there we, we you know, we have phones, we have text messages, we can we can have meetings in groups such such as, the, as these. Um, even those interactions when one is out for a walk or one is at the store and lets someone in front of them in the line or, or speaks with someone. Okay, um, engaging kindness uh, when we become in involved in, in something larger than our, ourselves. So relationships. Meaning, okay, so seeking meaning really helps us make sense of our experiences. And um, again, uh, Finding meaning can, can can contribute to positive well-being, to happiness, to resilience. This attachment to something larger than ourselves, right? Um, finding meaning, and again, evidence really shows that find having a purpose in our lives may actually add years to our lives. Right? Uh, there was a study of over six thousand people that showed that having a self sense of purpose actually help, may help us live longer. It does, there's not a single way to, to find meaning. It's not a single goal. It's different for all of us, but it's, but it's really uh, important. So three conditions that contribute to our perception of meaning, as you see here, you know, seeing our lives as being significant, that there's some logic, sensing that in some way our lives are worthwhile and part of a larger picture and, and, and doing something, being involved in something that gives us a sense of purpose. Uh, some of you might be familiar with Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor and a psychiatrist. And uh, this is uh, this quote from him, you know, um, life is never made unbearable by circumstance, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. And we can have purpose and meaning and experience it at any point in our lifespan. And of course, what brings us meaning may change at different stages, you know, in our lives. Um, on my website, if you're interested in exploring meaning more, uh, I've got a list of some po powerful questions. Uh, you get, again, free of charge if you go to my website, if you'd like to explore meaning a little bit more and some writings uh, you know, on that. I've also written a number of newsletters on it, on the topic. Uh, the, the A in PERMA accomplishments, and I think, you know, people, we know that, you know, when we have goals and we're working to achieve them, when the goals are realistic, whether they're large goals or small goals, that that really make, can, you know, can make a difference in our lives. For, for a lot of us, the challenge is right now when we're sheltering in and the ways that we have been and are being compelled to even more so now with what Governor Pritzker has says, how do we have, how do we uh, develop for ourselves or goals and how do we continue with goals maybe that we've been working on during this period of time maybe we have to adjust maybe we have to change some of those goals uh, to accommodate this period of time and so I'd like to share with you a concept uh, some of you may may be familiar with which is the concept of growth mindset uh, researcher Carol Dweck out of Stanford has identified two kinds of mindsets Growth mindset and fixed mindset. Okay, growth mindset is is this this belief we can adopt for ourselves that we can change and grow through effort, experience, and the willingness to learn from mistakes. That that the amount of ability that we have is not fixed. That we can always impact it. And um, a uh, a term that she uses that I like a lot, which is she calls it the power of yet. I didn't, I haven't done this yet. I haven't figured this out yet, but I can get to it, right? What, you know, so it, it really opens up opportunities uh, for us at any point really in the lifespan. Questions like, what can I learn from this? And so even as we go through this pandemic right now, you know, as we're, as we're going through our day to day, what can I learn from this? How can I grow or improve, right? How can I do this more effectively? What are the skills that I need 
you, to get through the day, to get through the week, to get through, you know, what's, go, what's going on right now. Perhaps this is one of the things people are, that is on people's minds, which is dealing with stress, right? So uh, I thought we should, we could touch on that. Um, a lot of this is common sense, but these really are the things that, that really help us manage stress. Um, you know, we, one of which is, you know, exercise, movement. Might not be able to go to the gym right now. I know uh, up here our, our, uh, in Illinois, uh, only the health clubs can only be 25% full, right? But we can continue to, to build movement. How do you build movement into your day? Right? How can you move a little more? Right. So uh, getting exercise really helps to uh, manage stress. And again, it doesn't have to be exercise at the gym. It can just be more movement even throughout the day in different ways or, or, or yoga or, uh, you know, uh, the work we're doing around the house in different ways. Also, you know, sleep, uh, you know, typically recommended seven to eight hours of sleep and also was a, an important thing for sleep, which is reducing distractions at night, you know, re reducing exposure to computers, the phone, turning off the TV uh, an hour before bedtime, especially for those of us that might be glued to the news these days. Right? And getting a sleep routine, developing a routine of things that you do maybe before you go to bed, turning off the TV, taking a shower, reading a book, uh, whatever that might be, right? Um, relaxing the mind. So uh, there are lots and lots of strategies for uh, mindfulness, for breath awareness, for just pausing during the day, right? Even, even just a moment here and there can make a really big difference and help to reduce the stress. You know, in the moment of uh, a stressful moment, really just like pausing and noticing, hey, wait, I'm breathing can make a difference. Also routines. And a lot of us, you know, during this, this period of time have lost some of the routines that we've been so used to in our day-to-day -day lives. And so to the degree that you've been able to or can in the future develop uh, routines during the day that help, you know, you know, getting up, getting dressed. There's a lot of people that aren't getting dressed during the day. Get up, get dressed, you know, going for a walk, making breakfast, call, you know, texting a friend, checking in with people, whatever it might be. But having routines can really help us with our resilience. Uh, we've talked about connections and relationships. Uh, so, and of course, that, that, that's a very, very important uh, for resilience and reducing stress. And then reaching out to other people. You know, asking for help and accepting help from supportive friends and family can really improve our ability to manage stress. It, it can help us to, to, let, to help others, and it also can help us to, to reach out to others for supporting us. That's good for us, right? And, and, and then if one continues to feel, you know, overwhelmed by stress, really not feeling resilient, you know, then reaching out to, you know, a, 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 a therapist, a, your physician, you know, your healthcare professional for additional help. I know we were going to leave some time for questions. So I'm going to continue talking here uh, of just a bit maybe, but uh, to finish the slide, but I'm going to also suggest if that's okay with you, uh, Norman, that if, if people have questions that you type them here into the chat and then, you know, Norman will share them with me. We'll give people kind of a chance to do that now. And I'm just going to just kind of finish up with a couple of additional slides. If that makes sense. Yes. Um, so a few other things, this, this top point here, recognizing that challenges, changes, and adversity are part of life. You know, they are not, they are, they're just natural part of life, right? And just in accepting that. And um, I wanna comment on this fourth point here, paying attention to how we interpret and respond to crisis, crises. So how do we label them when something happens you know, do, do we go to, oh my, you know, this is going to be the most terrible thing that's ever happened. I'll, I'll, I'll never get through this. Or can we, are there, once we see how we respond, can we 
you know, modify and reframe how we are interpreting the crisis. Yeah, this is really difficult and I'm really scared. Uh, but, you know, I, we'll figure out how to get through this. I, you know, I'll, fig I'll, I'll figure it out, take it a step at a time, right? And, and, and really paying attention to how we, we interpret crises can help us begin to shift how we interpret them. Um, noticing and paying attention to our view of ourselves, remembering what our strengths are and our capacities and, and the situations from which we have bounced back before. And, and what did we do to get, what, you know, what did I do to get through that situation? What can I bring from that situation to this situation to help me get through it? Um, trying to look at situations in a broader context. So sometimes we get stuck and it's something small. How can we look at it more broadly? And the, the last one here, trying to maintain an optimistic outlook. Optimis, optimism can be, it, realistic uh, uh but but do i look at this from a glass half empty or a glass half full how can i generate some hope um i'm gonna put in a plug here for humor right it's a great resilience tool smile laughing finding things that are humorous you know um sharing with others those 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 moments and even smiling it's an interesting uh fact that when we smile physiologically when we smile even if even if we sort of have to force that smile once we smile a lot of times we begin to feel better in other words our 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 mind notices that our body is smiling right so uh um and 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 the other point i'd like to mention here is is paying attention to what's really important and fulfilling to you and trying to get a little bit of it into your life. Even if it's 15 minutes in a week, right? It can really help well-being. It can really help build resilience. Norman, are there any questions? Well, we're going to unzoom uh, everybody here. Let's see. Oh, oh, you mean un unmute everybody? Yes, un un unmute. I'm sorry. There you go. Okay. We're unmuted. I think each person still has to unmute themselves, Norwin. Yes. Just allow them to do that. Alan has to unmute. Yeah, Alan, you're still muted too. If any, yes. Yeah, so if you're unmuted and you have a comment or a question and you'd like to share it, please feel free. Yes, Dr. Burns. Eileen is fine. You can call me Eileen. Eileen? Yeah. Um, does anyone else have a question before I speak? Okay. Um, my name's Harvey Stoller. I'm with uh, Aguda Sacha Men's Club in Alexandria, Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C. And I was, I, what kind of, the, what, I, the thing I question most of your talk is that which dealt with the meaning of life. And that sometimes has become a joke for comedians and people who spoof the, uh, you know, Ronald Coleman climbing up the mountain in Shangri-La to ask the guru, what's the meaning of life? You know, it's become kind of a joke. And I'm, um, you know, we've been trying to answer that question. Mankind's been trying to answer that question since we were formed. And, um, I think only each individual can answer for themselves what's their own meaning of life. I don't think we can give that a broad answer. Do you or? No, no, I, I completely agree with you. And, and what I was really speaking about here, uh, you know, not, not what is the meaning of life, like the big meaning, but, but more so about identifying what's meaningful for us in our individual lives. 
point. Someone earlier mentioned that, that they enjoyed their being with their grandchild grandchildren. So mm -hmm. so you know that that might be meaningful. Or I, I I'm I'm working on a on a book. I also enjoy being with my grandchildren, but I'm working on a book that's very meaningful to me. Um, maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, the time that one donates, uh, you know, at one synagogue um, or or uh, volunteering somewhere that that's really what uh, I was really speaking about meaning, I guess, with a little M rather than with the capital M. Okay. Does that clarify? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Harvey. Are there uh, other, uh, other questions? I see a hand up, but I can't see the, the, the person's Barry. name. Yeah, Barry. Barry. Yeah. So um, first a comment, then a question. So I have a client of mine that's a psychiatrist, and he has been totally swamped since the pandemic hit. Um, also on the news, uh, I see so many news pieces about the mental health of so many people during this time has deteriorated so much. So my, my question is that, is there possibly uh, the fact that so many people are unprepared to be resilient? And if so, do, they, do we need to have proactive resilience mm -hmm. training before the tragedy hits, mm -hmm. crash and burn? So that's a big question. Right? You know, yeah, I mean, so many people are struggling. This is such a difficult time. You know, to the degree in, in any in any of our lives that we can be proactive, right? That we can, you know, that we can build the build skills and strategies that we can use during difficult times, you know, that's so important and so helpful, right? And if we could, you know, the more that we can offer that, let's say in the schools, like uh, offering our kids these kinds of strategies, um, and and um, and then we bring the you know carry those those forward as adults. You know when we see that we're challenged in certain ways, you know we we have the capacities to learn about and and gain these skills. Uh, and at the same time, you know many of us, you know we we. A, a tragedy or a difficulty hits us at a particular time in life, and maybe we're struggling with a number of other challenges at that time, and and we do need some help. You know, we do need to go to to a professional to help us get through that. People have different, you know, people have have uh, been through traumas and other challenges in their lives. People have uh, comorbidities, you know, uh, mental health issues, physical issues, or or maybe sometimes a series of traumas all at the, or difficult all at the same time. So I, I, I know that, you know, mental health professionals are swamped right now and it's not surprising, but to your point about being proactive, yes, absolutely. You know, the more we can, we can be proactive, um, you know, in our reading, in our learning, in our, in our schools, you know, as a, if for kids, adolescents, adults, I mean, that the better that is. If I may add to that, I think a big uh, issue with so many people, especially as people get older, um, the fact that they are single and home alone yeah. and this isolation. And there's been a lot of um, news media and different uh, stories and newspapers and magazines about the uh, detrimental effects of the isolation during the pandemic. Nobody ever thought it would be, you know, lasting eight months as it's been, and it's going to go on for many more months until people can get back out and get back into the world again. So the isolationism um, is really, uh, you know, it's it's very detrimental to to good mental health. You're, you know, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, and, and I guess uh, for all of us, and particularly for people who are alone, and I, you know, I have many friend, friends who are, and I mentioned my mother before, you know, um, how, what are the options for reaching out, right? You know, um, groups people can get involved in with uh, that meet virtually or, uh, you know, visits, distance visits outside, you know, and, and, you know, different kinds of options, but absolutely, that is one of the most uh, devastating um, 
complications of this of this situation and the then the long the extent of it. I, I agree. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, it's Bob Watts um, in Virginia, and thanks very much. Really a lot of food for thought in your presentation. You know, uh, we're getting along fine. My wife, you know, we're just recently empty nesters. My wife and I are getting along fine. I'm very involved in the synagogue, which is nearby, and we're doing outdoor activities and not not too bad. But what's, you know, starting to weigh on me is the kind of longer term effect. Now we're getting so, we're getting trained to be so resistant to human contact, even to, you know, personal contact that uh, when I see a program on TV where people are like hugging or <laughs> there's a group of people getting together in a and a friendly social thing, it, it makes me feel strange, you know, and I, uh, and I wonder about the effect on us all for the long run, too. Well, you know, I, I feel like it'll take a while to come out of that, even when there is a vaccine. I, I hear what you're saying, and I've had the same reaction when I see it on see that on TV. Uh, you know it, that that you know that is a concern, and and, in, and you know we may not go back to exactly the way things were either. Think we may there may be a new normal. Maybe people won't be shaking hands as frequently and things like that. I mean, I'm concerned about kids too who are growing up. You know, uh, young children who are are being formed by the, by these kinds of by this situation as well. Uh, I, I guess time will tell and, and then uh, each of us then will make decisions uh, in our own lives and in our relationships about how we will go forward. But I guess we won't know that till we see how this progresses. And even then I was on a, uh, another webinar last night at a, a, my wife's home synagogue in New Jersey about the, you know, how long it's actually going to take before the vaccine and, uh, you know, is widespread enough that, uh, you know, it's not going to be a short time before we're all able to go back, go back out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to, is it, was it Marlene who made the comment? Yeah. You know, one thought that I have uh, uh, about that, I, a very resilient 85-year-old woman that I know, one of the things that she is doing, she lives alone, is that she makes a point that every day she calls or contacts someone. She, she reaches out to someone. And she feels empowered, I think, and, and very good about doing that. And of course, people really appreciate that. And some of those people are then reaching back to her. Right. You're on mute. You're yeah. on mute. Hours early on, back in the spring, through our synagogue on Shayemet here in Chicago, they set up um, a volunteer system whereby we were all given a list of members to call just to reach out and say, hi, how are you doing? Is there anything that the synagogue can help you with? Are you having any problems? We haven't pursued that lately, but that was a nice thing early on where it gave um, especially older members a chance to, you know, talk about uh, any problems that they're having. But making sure that, you know, you call people, we have some single friends also, and I make it a point, one in particular, that I call at least every week, say, what's doing, how are you doing, you know, and uh, reach out to her that way. Our synagogue did the same thing. It's a, and people were very appreciative of it. Yes. Well, I know we're, we're just a bit after eight o'clock, so, um, uh, if there's any further questions, we can get to them. But just uh, just a couple of closing thoughts, you know, um, if I may, you know, as Thanksgiving uh, comes uh, towards us next week, yeah. you know, we're reminded uh, 
about giving thanks. We're reminded to notice the moment um, and maybe to, to take care of ourselves and each other. And, and I mentioned to Shuva at the beginning and, you know, every moment can be, can become a turning point in our lives. And, you know, what are the opportunities and the challenges of this period of time? How can, uh, how can any of us try to uh, deal with the adversity, look for the little windows of possibility, you know, uh, and maybe to reach out uh, to help others, maybe in, in ways of personal growth, you know, and, and how can we use the tools in our toolbox? for resilience. And uh, I mean, I just offered a few ideas here today. You know, there are many, many more um, and lots of resources. If you, if you Google resilience, you'll find tons and tons of, of resources. Um, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to, to be with you today. I really uh, have enjoyed uh, being with this group. And uh, um, I thank Norwin for the opportunity. Uh, I encourage you perhaps to take a moment before you go wherever you do uh, and your next steps within uh, the evening to consider, uh, you know, in coaching, I always ask people before we hang, we hang up, what, what changed for you today? Or what did you learn today that you want to take with you? You know, because a lot of times we go to talks like these and or we sit home for talks like these and then we go on to the next thing and we don't take that moment to kind of consolidate what we might want to remember. So I just uh, just offer that as a as a suggestion. Uh, and, and lastly, um, if you like what you heard tonight uh, and you'd like, I, I send out a monthly newsletter on all of these kinds of uh, topics related to uh, resilience, uh, positivity, mindfulness, well-being. Uh, you can uh, get find out about that by going to my website, ibzcoaching.com. And again, I, I'd love to hear from people uh, going forward about how maybe uh, this uh, talk uh, impacted you. Or if you've got any questions, please feel free uh, to contact me. And, uh, and or if anyone is interested in, in coaching. If I can help out in any way, I also would be happy to do that. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Just remember to fly, thank not you. survive. Thank you, uh, Eileen. Don't, I'd like don't, to, don't uh, forget to stop the recording. Click stop recording, please.